So we'll assume you had a good weekend, huh? All right. Well, I guess I got to stop chatting and start getting going here. <laughs> okay, good. You can hear me. Great. I'm glad that you can hear me. All right. I'm 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 glad everybody has shown up. Thank you for coming today and um, welcome to our little mini lecture today about how you should start with SaaS, SaaS software. And this is the last of my little lecture series on case studies and SaaS integration. I'm a big SaaS evangelist. I'm always getting in trouble with SaaS because I'm always talking about them and they're not open source, right? So I'm like a free sales rep for them. <laughs> really, they don't pay me. In fact, I get in trouble with them for talking about it, but why do I talk about SaaS? It's really ubiquitous in my field of public health. And so I'm, I'm happy that you showed up today and I can share some of my knowledge with you about, about SAS because I've been using, I've been a user a long time. So, um, so this is about how should you start with SAS? And I'm just going to be really philosophical with you. Uh, you can be born again <laughs> in SAS. So I'm not really that young. Like I'm in my 50s and I've been using SAS for 20 years. But I, I feel born again with SAS and you'll see why. Um, so there's some challenges in the future with SaaS. I'm just not going to lie. Um, when you're an old software company and your software has been around a long time, you're going to have challenges as things like the internet get invented. Okay. But there's like something I really see that's really awesome in the future for SaaS that's different from the past. So you really want to sit and listen to what I found in my um, research. So I'm Monica Wahi, and I'm a data scientist sort of in the healthcare space. A lot of you know me already, um, but you know I'm an epidemiologist and biostatistician. And so if you're new to learning SaaS, so first of all, if you're not new to learning SaaS, then you already know SaaS. So you kind of know what I'm going to be talking about. But you want to stick around to really see what everybody's saying about SaaS now. Because if you've been using SaaS, that means you've maybe been using it since the maybe 80s, maybe 90s, maybe maybe 2000s. You know, some people have been using it that long. And you have a really different view of it than when you're just starting with it. So when was I just starting with it? I was just starting with it in the early 2000s. If you're just starting with it now, you might be able to relate to the story, okay? So when in about 2000, if you went to a college of public health and you went to learn SAS, this is what would happen, okay, is you would take a biostatistics class that would meet in a classroom like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then you'd have a lab that would meet on like Saturday or something for a long time, and it would meet in the computer room at the school. When you sat down at that lab, there would be somebody like a teaching assistant at the front who's a biostatistician, and that person would teach you like how to log into the SAS server. So you'd have this command prompt and it'd be kind of a black screen and, you know, you'd be typing on, you know, there'd be a cursor and you'd go into SAS. And what you could do is you could create code and you could launch code um, if you did that you had to make sure that it, the code was mapping to the right data sets because the data sets would be on that server. So you'd be creating code on that server, running the SAS code against data sets on that server. And every time you did that, you know what you would have to do? You'd have to look at the log file, right? Because you'd have to see if the code you executed worked. So you'd have to call that up. Remember this is all command prompt. And also, what about your results? You know, let's say you ran proc freak, you look for two way frequencies. Well, you'd have to also type that in to call that up. Now, this, if if you, you know, say history programming, that's a very normal thing to have to do. You know, the problem is in the year 2000, we already had like Microsoft Access, and I was running Microsoft Access databases. So these were databases that kind of look like, you know, Microsoft Word looks or Microsoft Excel, like today. So when I was learning this and I was going, oh, <laughs> you mean we don't have any windows or like, we, we, you know what I mean? Like, because I had these expectations I got from Microsoft Access and I was like, are we really going to keep doing this? I mean, isn't there going to be a more Microsoft Access-y like version of SaaS? Well, the answer was kind of, yeah, uh, I just needed to wait about a year or two when they came out with PC SaaS. So PC SaaS 
you installed on your computer. You could even install it on a pretty powerful laptop. And when you would run it, you'd run it as an application, and it really kind of did look a little like Windows XP. Um, oh, I see someone in the chat. Oh, hi, uh, Ebenezer's in the chat. Everybody say hi to Ebenezer. He is my fan and colleague and a great uh, digital marketer. If you ever need digital marketing in the science space, contact Ebenezer. All right, so PC SaaS was like wonderful because I was so like done with the command prompt stuff because I wanted to look at the log file and the output and everything at the same time. I wanted it to look like access and so, PC SAS was all Windowsy and looked like that. And so I was really happy, right? But think about it. It's PC SAS. So what happened to the server and this whole uh, networking idea we I just was talking about? Remember on the, you know, when you go on the command prompt and you, your data is on the server, like everything's on the server. It's this beautiful SAS environment. And so I was like, okay, my little SAS environment on my laptop, like how am I going to do that with like a cohort study? So, um, so that's what I was thinking back in 2000. So just to recap, there was this weird command prompt stuff going on. They gave me PC SAS at school. I loved it. It looked really Microsoft Access-y, Microsoft Wordy, and stuff. But I was wondering, what's going to happen if you try to network this? Okay. So if you kind of remember the evolution of the internet, you know, the internet was there in 2000, but you really couldn't put data online. You really couldn't do, like my friends had a startup and they were selling computer parts and they wanted to automate people like going to their web page and looking up the inventory like live. So when they sold stuff, it would update and, and they had the worst time. And I this must have been before 2003 because I was living in Minnesota and this was happened in Minnesota. So um, then I moved to Florida, which was totally a mistake, but that's another story. But anyway, so, you know, data handling on the web was just not good. So people didn't really have databases on the web. So this early period of PC SaaS uh, you know, I never really thought about SaaS serving to the web. I was like, why? You know, I, 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 it never even occurred to me. But now think about it. That's the big deal, like serving data to the web, interacting with the web and, and SaaS and everything. So when I was back then, I was going, okay, what is the future of this? And I wasn't saying it like in a negative way. I was just saying like, we clearly need the analytics. Like SaaS analytics is amazing. So how are we going to get that analytics by the data? and by the team without a SaaS server because I can't build a SaaS server on my laptop, right? So now fast forward is 2023. Let's say you're newly learning SaaS now. You might have like similar kind of thoughts because even though maybe you're learning SaaS via or maybe using um, SaaS ODA, the free version on the web, um, let's just admit it, it really doesn't handle like modern programs, right? It really feels very legacy. You know, so how are we going to do this now? How are we like SAS via exists? It's on the web at SAS ODA exists on the web, which is amazing. You'll hear me go on and on about that, how awesome that is. But like, OK, now what are we going to do? Like now SAS is, has met us, you know, met R and Python and SQL and stuff on the web. And now how do we work with it? Like, what do we do? Like SAS was used literally for many things for decades. Okay, but some of those uses now I'm so you'll if, if you showed up to some of my earlier lectures, you'd find that there were components that were so amazing in SAS 20 years ago that now if you adapted them, you're kind of like, oh, my God, how do we get out of here? Because even though they're still awesome, it's like the world around SAS changed and now there's something like way better. And you'll see this when I go through the research I did for this um, presentation, How what I mean by that. Well, before we continue, I just want to make sure you know about that I'm holding a um, free online workshop in application basics for SAS integration. So what is it? It's You can see the sessions on the slide. It's three sessions. They're gonna be like two to three hours because I don't know how many people show up. It might be longer, so you'll budget for three hours. So, um, And it's Monday, Wednesday, and Friday next week. And it starts at noon um, Eastern time because I think that's a, probably the best time for everybody internationally. So what's gonna happen at the workshop? 
Because the workshop is based on an actual online course that I developed that's part of my data science mentoring program. So if you want to elevate your skills in data science and, you know, produce portfolio projects and actually do some real world applied projects, you're going to want to check out my um, mentoring program. Um, but what this, it, this workshop, it just takes one of the courses from that mentoring program because there's a foundation courses and I'm actually going to teach it to you. So it's an online course. You could go through it on your own, but I'm going to teach it to you. So you don't have to. And what I'm going to do is talk, the course is exactly like mainly about applications. So if you're like me and you came through like master's public health or you learned biostatistics or whatever, you probably didn't learn about how computer applications are built or about business applications. And so it becomes really difficult then if you want to do application um, integration. Oh, that's great, Michael, that you're interested here. I'll follow up with you um, afterwards and, and we'll connect. That sounds good. Um, wonderful. Yeah. So, you know, we as we move forward in health analytics and public health, we the word application now we're going, whoa, somebody's using their diabetes application. Somebody else is, you know, saving their steps in their steps application. You know, how are we going to take that data? Of course, we're going to want to put in SAS, right? Eventually, like if you want to make a model. Um, <clears throat> How are we going to put SAS in that pipeline? And, and that's the, it's sort of like the agony and ecstasy of SAS. So if you're a legacy SAS user, you're going to start crying. <laughs> and if you're a new SAS user, you're going to start cheering because I have bad news for old people and good news for new people, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, if you just want the news, please sign up for this online workshop. It'll be a blast because we'll all get to discuss the thing about making application pipelines yeah there's a lot of technicality to it but it's really design it's really thinking it, like i'm an epidemiologist and if you've heard of like bradford hill causal criteria you know it's really doing that kind of head work into figuring out how you're going to make your application pipeline and make your dashboard sing or make your analytics gorgeous or whatever, okay? So you'll have fun. I guarantee you'll have fun if you show up at this workshop. So, and please hurry up and sign up because it starts tomorrow. Um, alrighty, so uh, now I'll get back to the regularly scheduled program. And I'm actually checking the chat. I'm learning how to use <laughs> Zoom. So please feel free to ask questions and I might even notice. <laughs> okay, so, um, Today, what if you are new to SAS? So I just griped about how freaked out I was learning SAS 20 years ago when I was like going, oh my God, this is Kermit and Brahms and I just am using Access over here. You know, like I was, I don't know. You know how like sometimes young people have like really high expectations of technology. I've kind of come down from it now. But I said, you know, I need to refresh myself. I need to figure out what it would be like if I were that today. So I went on Reddit and I, I put the link in the slide, but it's really not important who is actually saying these things. So I just kind of covered their names. What's important is the points they're making. And this is actually a two-year-old post, but, you know, SAS kind of moves slow. So I think this stuff still applies. And so... The questioner went on Reddit, you know, Reddit is kind of the social media where people talk anonymously and very frankly, they t tend to talk very openly. Um, I'm not a big Reddit user, but I found this and I thought this is great. So just to step back, Reddit, why would I be using evidence from Reddit? Well, part of the problem was what I started looking for was just reviews of SAS, like people just writing up, like Gartner writing up, oh, SAS has this new component or whatever. And I actually just could not really find anything. Like I found a lot of marketing material from SAS and case studies from SAS, but the problem is they were not, you know, if you're in the open source community, you're really used to seeing very technical marketing stuff. Even if they're not really selling anything, like if you're a consulting company that sells like R, integration right like you'll do services when you talk about like our packages you use you talk about how awesome they are and it's not like you're really selling r you're selling kind of yourself right like that you can apply these packages you know and so it's sort of weird like how does SaaS make a marketing message right and i think that they don't maybe don't realize that they have to get technical with us. They have to start talking about their components and making diagrams and stuff. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I really want to see. Um, but, you know, they're private companies. So then how much do they want to share? 
you know, so I don't know what they're going to do about that. But the bottom line was I couldn't find like really good evidence-based official just opinions of what they were doing or case studies or use cases. So I went and read it. Okay. So this is the question I picked and I think it's really good. The uh, questioner says, I just moved from Python to SAS for four months due to new job requirements. So I'm imagining this person's like a data scientist who maybe works on um, contracts. And so Python, I don't know Python, I know R, but Python is open source and it's pretty complex just like R. So, uh, so this person adopted SAS for four months for a project at a job. And they asked, so they had four months of experience with it. And they asked, I wonder how you think SAS compared with other languages in a future. And so I'm gonna sort of interpret why I think this person was asking this. It's because they probably had this experience that the SAS was really challenging compared to Python. And we're like wondering, should I, now that I know four months of SAS and it's hard, should I throw myself into SAS or should I just back away from it's too hard? And the short answer I would say to that person is, depends on how you feel. Like if you really like SAS, if you had a good experience and you want to throw yourself into SAS, I would say do it. If you really didn't enjoy it, if it wasn't a enjoyable experience, then don't, don't do it. You won't enjoy it. You know, I mean, that's as simple as I would say. Why? Because there's a place for you. It doesn't matter which person you are. Are you the person who throws yourself in the SAS or not? There's a place for you in data science. Um, all right. So, so that's the short answer. But now I'm going to, um, I'm sort of going to frame it. Should you throw yourself into mastering a challenging data science programming language that has been around since the 1970s? So that's maybe what this person is asking. And so I, <laughs> in 2000, that's still a good question, right? So 20 years ago, it didn't matter whether I said yes or you know, sat, yes or no to that question because SAS is still here. We're all still using it. And at the time, it was the only game in town. Now it's a question, right? Like we've got Python and everything. Um, but like I said, the advice I give this questioner is if they enjoyed SAS, you know, they liked it and they saw a future for themselves in it. Yeah, throw yourself into it because there's going to be a role for you. But if you really didn't like it, I don't know if you're going to like having a whole career in SAS. But that's but what's different about SAS today, and that's sort of what I'm going to say is, is in the olden days, you kind of had to be in for a penny in for a pound with SAS. Like either you had to set up a SAS server shop and then just keep living in the SAS environment and not really integrate, not use SQL, not use other things. Or you had to just figure something else out, which there wasn't anything else. Like if you really need to do analytics, then you just figured it out with SAS, right? But nowadays, SAS is different because we have VIA, right? And so imagine you have any applications that are online applications. Like I was, somebody contacted me from like Oracle NetSuite, who's I think a salesperson. And I don't know much about Oracle NetSuite, but just the word NetSuite made me think, oh, maybe this is like online Oracle. If it's online Oracle, just think of how easy that would be to integrate with online SaaS, like SaaS via. So you're the, those of you who've been around SaaS a long time are starting to see what I'm seeing, which is you today, if you're a new startup, you can adopt SaaS without having to adopt the SaaS server. You can just get the analytics, right? Which is what you wanted in the first place. So I'm kind of getting in my head of myself, but that that's sort of what's beautiful and new. And then now I'm going to tell you what's ugly and old, okay? So one of the things that kind of disappointed me was I found sort of a theme that open source solutions work better and are cheaper right now. So for example, let's say you have a problem, like you need to do principal component analysis and you don't, you haven't done it. These people suggest go look for an open source solution before you turn to SaaS, even if you have a SaaS shop. So this one person said that their department got rid of SaaS due to infrastructure issues and high costs, and that they converted all the SaaS workflows into Python and saved a lot of money. The reason I put this up there is I wasn't sure you could do that. Like I didn't even, I wasn't sure you could do that. I wasn't sure that was even possible. And so 
the fact that that person said they did it and they said they did it two years ago, I'm like, okay, well, maybe not in every shop, but it definitely was possible in that shop. And in the next shop where it says my company's doing the same thing. Now, this is something really interesting. They, this person says they are porting everything over to Python and some stuff to NIME. My understanding is NIME is a platform you can do AI on and other automation, which is open source. Okay. So the word porting, okay. I have not heard anybody use that term since I was like a teenager. So I'm like, okay, that we say migrating now. We don't really say porting, but when I was little, you know, because we were stealing software, we'd port it over from one system to another. You know, I mean, it's bad, but, you know, but you couldn't even buy it. That's the thing is you go to computer stores and they wouldn't even sell the software. <laughs> but anyway, so the problem is if today you've got a problem and you want to solve it with SaaS, you're probably going to get, it's easier for you to get a return on investment with an open source solution. Now just make, here's the fair comparison, okay? SaaS costs a lot of money, but they give you a lot of support. They give you a, big, a, a product and support. Like they'll come and help you. Like SaaS, whenever I've worked somewhere where SaaS, we have SaaS, they are like hands-on helping me. They're on the phone, you know? So I, I love that about them. And when you get spoiled of that and you're fighting with R or Python, you miss it, okay? So SaaS is not just software, it's support. It's a whole bunch of other things, okay? But still, it is easier to get ROI with an open source solution, even if you dump a lot of effort into it because of certain structural barriers, basically, because of that whole SaaS environment thing. You know, if you're outside the SaaS environment, it's really hard to get good IO in and out of the SaaS environment. So it's just, um, so this is this is a big problem for SaaS right now. You know what I mean? Like that you can have open source solutions to some of the things that they sell to you and the open source solutions are cheaper and easier to implement. Not everything, certainly not everything, but that's some of the problem with some of what SaaS has sold. Like there are times in the past where those components were awesome. Like if you think about the output delivery system, oh my God, amazing. But now the output delivery system, I'm sorry, like it's old fashioned. So if you're depending on it, in your workflow, it's like, what are you gonna do now? You know, so even people in SaaS shops are trying open source solutions first before looking at adding SaaS components for all these reasons, for the structural reason, for the fact that you actually have to pay SaaS for the component, you know, then you have to change your workflow. So, uh, I, and I would keep recommending that, but that's not gonna work each time, okay? Now, this is kind of a problem. And I think SaaS is undergoing an identity I don't know if I want to call it crisis, but an identity shift. I, I think they're really trying to change their image because they don't have a very good image among like influencers. You know what I mean? Because SAS is not very open. Like it pretends to be open, but then like me, like their content, their legal wants to contact me because I'm telling everybody to adopt SAS. I'm like, I have a book about SAS. I am a LinkedIn learning author on SAS. Like that doesn't pay me. They they threaten me. So I'm like, you know, you can't go around doing stuff like that and get people to love you and want to like your posts and stuff, Sass. You know what I'm saying? And so that's my rant about Sass. This is that rant, if you look at it from a different point of view, sounds like what these people are saying, person one, two, and three. I, I put like you can download the slides and see their entire rant. But basically, SaaS is kind of spoiled because, like I said before, it was really cool to have that SaaS environment. If you had a SaaS server, you were very happy. And you could just add components. You could fill it up with data. That thing just ran, like, beautiful. Like, it was beautiful. It, I, I love you. You know, I love going to that computer room and using the SaaS server. It just goes so fast, and it had everything you wanted. But... The problem is they didn't really innovate until it was too late. Like they kind of didn't get on and start realizing that R and Python were kind of competing with them. And so one of the people, you know, these people are saying SaaS is always trying to sell us some expensive add-on that doesn't work as well as Python or R solutions. Well, 20 years ago, if you needed something and you were a SaaS shop, of course you would get a comp new component. What else? I mean, there wasn't anything else. 
now if you need to make a dashboard or something, why would you use SAS? Why not use Python or R? And so, um, and if you come to SAS and you're like, we need to make a dashboard, they'll try to sell you something that's not going to make you a dashboard as good as Python or R. So then people get mad at SAS when they act like that, you know? Then the other problem was it's hard to do remote work with SAS. But to be honest with you, that only applies to legacy server setups. If you are in startup and you buy like SAS via and you are completely on the on the web, I'm sure remote work will be like no problem. The problem is, is if you had one of those beautiful SaaS environments, those are physical environments, right? And you can, you know, like tunnel into them, you know, like Telnet kind of stuff, but it's not really like, it's not like we're used to doing remote work. Like it, it, you're in the SaaS environment, like, and you have to navigate it. It's really, I've done that and it's really like awkward and stuff is a little passion. So it's like easier to just be on site at those SaaS servers. And there's SaaS consultants. So you can just hire them to come to your site and do stuff, you know. But then do you really want to like adopt server SaaS today? And the answer is no, don't start a new SaaS server. <laughs> like that's not a good idea today. Um, the reason why anybody needed to put data on SaaS servers was because you needed to serve it to the analytics component as efficiently as possible. So you don't have IO problems. Now you can serve it to SAS via from Oracle NetSuite or whatever. So you don't need to build a, a SAS server. But if you have one, that's the irony of it. Like, what are you going to do now, right? I, I guess hire consultants like me to come over and <laughs> see if we can tinker with your server. Um, person three, I'm sort of like paraphrasing what they said is, now, this is another problem. We can't find someone with the necessary SaaS skills, but we already built everything in SaaS, so we were stuck. And so that's why if you happen to be the kind of person who's new to SaaS and you're like, wow, this is a really interesting program. These products are really interesting. I'd love to automate stuff in macro language. I'd love to learn all of these components. I'd really like to make pipelines in SaaS. If you're feeling that, Run, run after that feeling. Throw yourself into SAS. SAS has so much. And you probably, I mean, there's only so much you can do on your own outside of an organization. But if you can get yourself into a SAS using organization, like most pharma organizations are that way, you can just have a blast. Like if that's where you're at, there are just so many solutions you can build in a SAS environment. And so, and you'll get paid a lot because it, like every time I look for the last 10 years, People don't, are not becoming SaaS users. They're not adopting SaaS. New people are like, no thanks, I'll go to Python, I'll go to R. It, it, you can just download them. You can download R and Python and just use it. Of course, you can use SaaS ODA on the web, but it's it's not like there's a whole open source community behind SaaS ODA telling you what to do. Although, if you read my book, um, Mastering SaaS Programming for Data Warehousing, I'll I'll show you how to oh or take my free online course I'll show you how to do it but um but yeah so if you like SaaS the future is yours you, you'll just keep getting more and more money in in your salary um so but another problem is that will only work you'll keep getting more and more money in your salary if the SaaS st shops stay SaaS shops right. So one of the other problems that they were running into was that it actually, from one of my earlier lectures, some SaaS shops are just running out of money. They just can't pay. You know, SaaS keeps increasing their prices. Of course, it costs money to run a business, but people just can't pay, or I should say people, organizations can't pay. So what they start to do is sort of make, take some of their operations, like especially visualizations and stuff, and start like taking them out of SAS and moving them, migrating them to R, migrating them to Python, maybe migrating some data storage to SQL. They start just migrating some pieces out of the SAS environment, some functions too. But think about it. 
if that's going to happen, you still need to know how to use SaaS really well. Because instead of operating in the environment, you're going to have to get stuff out of the environment, or you're going to and you're going to have to know SaaS and something else. Because if you're going to have to study the SaaS version and then rebuild it in Python or R, so that's that's all going to be going on. So these are legacy SaaS shops. That that's activity that's going to be going on at all of them. So um, one person made this observation, or two people made this observation, that SAS, I quoted this, SAS being intertwined with education was a big deal. And I do want to emphasize that. That is why a lot of SAS users who learn SAS in college don't know much about applications in general, right? Because if, I mean, theoretically, you could learn a lot of informatics in a few classes and a master's in public health or a master's in biosciences statistics. But the reality is SAS is so hard to use that you spend all your classes learning SAS. Although I've been told that it's a little different now, that they're trying to introduce R and Python into these course curricula. Um, but how SAS got to be such a monopoly over education is it really started in the education space. And really, you need to have a university to run a SAS server. And you know, if university are running a SaaS server, they have all the components. And the idea was, you know, if I'm at the University of South Florida using their SaaS server and I can use their geographic stuff and I can use their sentiment analysis stuff and I can play with SaaS enterprise guide or whatever, when I leave and graduate, you know, they're going to cut me off. I can't use USF server anymore. So I'm going to want to go to a workplace that has SaaS and I'm going to tell them I want this, you know, SaaS enterprise guide and everything. And theoretically, that's kind of worked really well, actually, for SAS, because not only were they intertwined, have they always been intertwined with education, they've also been intertwined with the government. Like, I was sort of curious about, like, I was reading some stuff. I don't know a lot about CDISC, you know, these different pharma standards, um, because they're sort of new for me, like I'm that old, right? And what I realized is that SAS had a lot, like, SAS was part of writing those standards. Well. That actually answered a question in my mind. And that question was why about 10 years ago, the there was kind of a kerfuffle in the R community that people were using R for clinical trials and they were having trouble going through the FDA with their results. And I thought it was because the SAS engine is super amazingly awesome. Like that engine, when it calculates stuff, it calculates out to five zillion p-values, okay? And I don't think R does that. So that's what I thought they were talking about. But what really they were talking about is they just didn't trust people to rebuild the SAS macros and other programs and have them perform the same. Well, of course... Even if you look at it as a black box, you can always demonstrate it, you know, reliability and validity, even if you keep it a black box. But the the blacker box would be SAS, right? And so um, so now I better understand that. So so I I want to make sure you understand that SAS as a company is extremely powerful and therefore they're involved in education, they're involved in the government, they're involved in these standards and stuff. So for better or for worse, they're not going away. And if you embrace them, you will get the benefits of knowing SAS because they're in everything, right? Um, so that's the positive. The negative is you're going to have to know not just SAS, okay? Hopefully I've just convinced you of that. Even if you're a SAS, SAS enthusiast, you love SAS, and that's what you're going to do, big pharma, blah, blah, blah. The reality is encroaching upon SAS, and you have to do integration. Like, you're going to have to do some integration. Even if you're a SAS shop, even if you've got a server, you're going to have to do something. Like, it's never, you can't just keep buying SAS components. It's not going to work. So, I mean, even if you say, okay, well, I want to migrate to VIA. Okay, that's a whole, a whole enterprise, because what if you, what if you want to, put your data from the SaaS server into the cloud. Well, that's whole shebang right there. And so what I'm just saying is that even if you throw yourself and you're like, I'm going to be the SaaS superstar that saves the day, 
for all of these legacy server places that has the creative solutions that um, does all that. Well, the problem is you're going to have to get a whole lot of other training in informatics that you didn't get in your master's in public health, your biostatistics training, you know, that's not statistics, that's informatics, that's like business systems and stuff, which is why my free uh, workshop is basically an advertisement for it. So Another thing, like I'm in healthcare and epidemiology, I was actually surprised, not surprised, that people were saying that finance and banks are stuck in SaaS. I know healthcare is stuck in SaaS for these other structural reasons, um, but these people are saying that banks are stuck in SaaS. Uh, people in healthcare are not so negative about using SaaS, like SaaS is pretty cool. Like they don't go, oh, I hate it, you know. Like, like I, sometimes I'm in a bad mood about SAS, but mostly I like it when I'm using it. I like it. Well, they don't like it. These banking people. And the second person says banks got comfortable. Inertia did the rest. Most banking models don't need more than proc reg anyway, due to regulations requiring interpretability. You know, and and so it really looks to me like in the finance industry. SAS is really not the right solution. Like they don't even really need it. So I don't even know what's going to go on there. Right. And it takes a while. Like if, even if you want to leave SAS and do something else, even just for a function, like let's say that you have, a, you have a set of reports, right. And what happens is the reports generated and then you run a big proc tab to get the output. And let's say you decide, okay, well, let me just re generate the report and instead hand it off to our Python to have them serve it, the report to the web. Oh my God, that is a huge, huge task because the first step is to break down whatever SAS was doing and super document it. And then the second thing is to go try to build it in R or on the web or whatever. And then you got to do that validation thing. It is so much work. But if you save money and save time and your users are happy and you don't have to buy some component next year, it's well done work because you can probably, as the web um, evolves, you can probably keep that report going. But I don't know if you can keep that report going in a SaaS environment. So that's kind of the way I would see that. So finally, we have the SaaS champion. So I've read to you, a lot of negative stuff about SaaS, but I don't see negative stuff as saying negative stuff. I see it as opportunity. Um, there's a lot of opportunity in SaaS right now, just for even what I just described, like breaking down macros and figuring out what they're doing, you know, and you can use open source software to help you with that. You can use SaaS to help you with that too. And if you actually work in a place that has SaaS, they have SaaS licenses, you can call SaaS. Like, I have to tell you that the people at SAS have been really helpful to me. So, and you'll hear that they have a really good reputation for helping people. So I, I can't oversell that more. Like if you actually have SAS, you should really lean into it You know, at your workplace because you probably don't have it at home, right? Okay, so this first person said, I just kind of summarized what they said, SAS works. And though R and Python are better at some things, SAS will still be around for a while. And I would say, where you really want to look at SAS is as a competitor to, and this is my opinion, I, and I don't know if I'm off on the deep end, but a competitor to something like AWS um, or like, like big analytics. So imagine, imagine you have something like a snowflake setup, like a cloud storage setup. And how does your data get in there? It gets in there from a like a sales, a big sales like database. Okay. So now you've got you've got everything sort of in a SQL format, a relational database in Snowflake, uh, which is cloud storage. And then you've also got like your front end, you're basically your production database, um, which has all your sales transactions. Maybe you're selling like apps or something, or selling, I don't know, something online. Okay. And then you want to ask business questions of your Snowflake data. But your Snowflake data maybe is relational. So maybe you want to change its shape into a, like a warehouse or something. And then now what? SAS via. You can just lay that right on top. And now you're doing the big data thing and you don't need a server. And so that's sort of like 
kind of what I'm, you know, thinking about is that SAS will be around for a while, but maybe we need to get creative with how to use it. Um, so person two said SAS works, but only big companies can afford to keep paying for it and supporting it. And there's a dwindling labor pool. So what this means is if you're a, a small business, so I, I just want to say, I don't know how much it costs to adopt just SAS via if you're a small business. I hope they have good pricing for small businesses because they did not have good pricing for small businesses for PC SAS 20 years ago. Um, it was really inaccessible. I really hope that they have, but, but remember you have SAS ODA, which is free. So always play around with that. If you have public data and you want to try something, definitely use that. Um, but then the other side of what person two says is that you're going to really need um, SAS users forever. And they're going to need to be really good at everything. They're going to need to be good at macros, reporting, enterprise guide, enterprise minor, you know, all of that data management, data steps, you know, because look at all the problems we have, right? We have people migrating out of SAS. We have new people adopting SAS via like so there's all this activity in the in the um future, near future. It's just weird activity. It's like some like legacy people will be like exiting a lot of SAS and new people will be adopting SAS in a new way. So it's just gonna be like really chaotic in my opinion. Um oh and Quentin adds that he he has a long back so quentin's in our local boston SaaS user group and he says very true SaaS support is amazing with SaaS software you get validated software backed up by free technical support and again what's especially awesome about that is when you're trying to build pipeline solutions in your shop you can literally call SaaS and they'll be they'll collaborate with you. Like they'll help you because they're trying to sell you components and stuff, but they're not just trying to sell. They're trying to sell you solutions. So one of the biggest problems I saw with SaaS shops is that <laughs> the SaaS shop itself was lazy. Like they were lazy and, and it was, it was the shop's fault <laughs> because, the, you know, I'd go in and I'd be like, gosh, this is really slow. Or your server's like, what's up with your IO? And they're like, oh, I guess we have a whole bunch of data sets on. And I'm like, well, inventory them and take them off, you know, <laughs> or like do something, you know, or, or tune it or, you know, you can do thread threading. And, and so part of it is that like the, that banking thing, I'll bet those people in the IT department there just don't even care. And so, but, but on the other hand, if you, that's what I say, if you want to lean into SAS, they are so happy to help you. Um, I mean, if you are, paying customer they will help you because they know you're paying a lot and they do want you to use their components and it's not necessarily their components are not necessarily better than other things but if you're in a SaaS environment usually their components are going to work better for you as a first pass i don't know how SaaS is about demoing things but i would say if you're in a server environment and they're trying to sell you a component demo it see if you can demo it because uh, or or if, if it's in via you know it might run better than an open source solution like you just don't know so so don't don't make assumptions that's one of the things i learned at SaaS is first of all SaaS has an awesome log file let me just shout out to the log file it's very easy to collect data about how your SAS code runs. So do it, you know, try different environments, actually do scientific studies, because remember, if you're running five zillion reports and you can shorten that each report by like one second, just think of how much that matters, right? So this inertia is the main reason why companies use SAS today instead of migrating. And I would say that that is true about maybe not all of SAS, but like the components you probably shouldn't be having in your SAS environment anymore. Um, this person over here on the right side of the slide says something really hilarious. When SAS has a problem, they just pretend it is a new way of doing analysis. <laughs> and uh, they used to be kind of guilty of that, but I think now they're getting, they're coming around to being more realistic. Like they understand, you know, SAS didn't have any competition for a very long time. Like, I, like to, to clarify, I learned SQL like in the early 2000s and I already knew SAS. So I kind of knew access and then I learned SAS and I was analyzing stuff and then I learned SQL. And so I was sitting down and I was doing a SQL query. And if you know SQL, like you can do a count query where you take like a, 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 like a categorical variable and you can count it, right? 
And I remember I was sitting in a SQL classroom. And I was like, oh, look, I did a count query. And then I was like, oh, then I said to the teacher, I was like, oh, how do you do cross tabs? It's like a cross tabs. I'm like, yeah, like this is like gender by like education group. He's like, you, I don't know if you can do that in SQL. And that's when it started to hit me. Like, Rock Freak is amazing. Like, you can't really, I mean, you could do it in SQL. And I even <laughs> once met this guy who was trying to impress me. He was at a statistics conference and he was saying, guess what? I programmed a, uh, an ANOVA and a linear regression in SQL. And I and it did impress me. I was like, whoa, you did that? Like, and he's like, yeah, it took like all night to run. And then I was thinking, oh my gosh, like that's SAS, like that's SAS analytics. It's right there. That's the difference between SAS and SQL. But on the other hand, <laughs> in SQL, you don't need a million commands to just do a query, right? Like it's not data stepping. So that's the kind of issue, right? Is like data storage versus analytics. So you can still get the SAS tools to work for you today. Um, but besides the real analytics, the hardcore analytics, um, it's kind of hard and expensive and there are generally um, better open source tools. So this is the challenge. If you've got a legacy shop, you're gonna have to just relook at your shop and just see what to, what to do right going forward. And also businesses changed, right? Like print shops, like what do print shops do now? You know, so these are business changes that need to be reflected in your data system. And that that's just the pain that we all have to go through, I think. Um, but the take home message I would leave for everybody is that SAS is the COBOL of health data science. And that's not an insult. Um, it's just a reality. So my mom was a COBOL programmer. And by the way, COBOL is a really elegant program, she tells me although keep a lot of documentation, which I would say about SAS too. And, you know, during COVID-19, you may have noticed a lot of like unemployment systems around the U.S. just broke. Like they couldn't print unemployment checks. They couldn't do stuff. Well, my mom said a lot of those systems are actually in COBOL and there was just nobody to program that COBOL. And my mom didn't want to do it. Like she's done with that. So, I mean, I told her you can make a lot of money, but she's like not into that. But if you are into making a lot of money, um, you you could do that. Like you could prepare for that inevitability, like where you're the SaaS expert and there aren't really any, because it's kind of going fast. Like the real SaaS experts, like when I was at the army, I was there working there from 2008 to 2011. And we had the super, super duper SaaS expert. And she actually was retiring. Like if I had kept working there, we would have had to replace her. And she's like an indicative of that generation of SES programmers. We're, those people are just retiring and the new people are not like throwing themselves into SES at high rates that same way. So part of what I'm trying to tell you is if you're new to SES and you're liking it and you're seeing this vision that I'm describing and you want to be on that train, this is what you could be doing. Like in a lot of like future times, you might be saving people's like data, you might be saving their research projects the way COBOL programmers were, could have been saving people's unemployment. And so, you know what I mean? But um, so to be clear, SaaS alone is not the future. There's no future in setting up a SaaS server today, a physical one. There's no future in setting up today. You know, I mean, it's just we're, we're on the internet at a different time. But the future is probably in SaaS analytics because you can imagine probably pretty easily um, a situation where somebody goes online and they go to do a sales transaction and they're uber pricing it, you know, like they're pricing, like for surge pricing, like tickets, right? And that request gets handed off to SaaS analytics to run a little AI program and come back with a price. That's the highest price I'm going to pay for that ticket, given the features of my infant variables. You can see that handoff going back and forth to buy us. So, um, so somebody's going to have to um, somebody's going to have to uh, actually build that, right? Somebody's going to have to design that. Somebody's going to have to figure out the AI, or even you know what I think is so funny about AI is we always had framing ham. I mean that's just like risk scores and stuff. We could be doing that, and it's a lot simpler than AI. 
I guess that's explainable AI. But anyway, I mean, this is what SAS is for, and we can do it now. We can really, we don't have to sit in a, <laughs> in a doctor's office filling out a little risk score thing. We can literally hand off real-time questions Real questions to SAS Maya, have it run the algorithm, hand it back to us. Like it's a dream, but it's not the dream we were originally having. So now the future looks more like, um, to me, is trying to get data out of SAS servers and into the cloud so we can do the thing I was just describing, right? And so uh, so there's a big, uh, there's a big um, uh, op opening in the future for SAS users. Um, and so I would just say, if you're sassy, you should go and take advantage of it. All right. Well, thank you for putting up with me talking so long. I didn't plan on talking this long. But anyway, I guess there's a lot to say about SAS. Um, I just want to remind you, I'm Monica Wahi, and I'm a SAS user, but I use a lot of other things, as you could tell. Um, and I want to encourage you to sign up for my um, online workshop. It starts tomorrow, so hurry up and sign up if you want it. It's free. And um, if, especially if any of the topics I said today really stimulate your thinking, just sign up and come to it and we'll be discussing exactly those topics. Well, thank you so much for showing up today and I hope you have a good uh, rest of your Sunday. Thank you for watching this video, which is part of the Public Health to Data Science Rebrand Program. If you are interested in joining the program, please sign up for a 30-minute Zoom interview using the link in the description.